Hi, this is Schieffer's Magic Alcove and I am Schieffer Bradigan. So today I thought I would talk about the pluses, minuses, pros and cons of either being in a group and finding a coven or being a solitary. And I've had experience in both. So I'm going to start the discussion with some of my experiences of group and coven work. Uh, just to give you an idea of some of the variety of things that can happen. So when I lived in Santa Cruz, I happened to, I ended up in two covens at the same time. One was a group of all women, the other was a mixed group. In the group of all women, um, I was just a general member. We were sort of working on the idea of everybody is equal, nobody's in charge, didn't want to have any of that patriarchy kind of stuff involved. And in the um, other group, I was actually the high priestess leader of that group. It's not like the first group I ever had, but these two were sort of an interesting, both of them had different issues that were going on in them and have opportunities to learn. So I'm going to start off with the All Women's Coven. The way we got together was probably not the best method for finding a group of like-minded individuals. Uh, we had all taken a class from another couple of women who were just doing a basic introduction into magic and ritual and paganism, etc. And at the end of the class, she just said, so if you want to learn more, keep on going and work together and see what happens. Yeah, I don't recommend that. I mean, it could work out for some people, I suppose. But the fact is, we didn't really know each other very well. And we didn't understand at that point some of the huge differences that there might be between us. <clears throat> and, you know, if you're going to work with people, their personal ethics are important um, to coincide with your personal ethics. Uh, it's not a good idea to do magic with a group of people where, when your ethics are diametrically opposed to one another. So anyway, <clears throat> it turned out that about a third of the group were militant feminist lesbians. And lifestyles I don't care about, don't care about sexuality or attraction or anything else. But the militant feminist lesbians that we had in our group were not just lesbians, they were actively hating of men. And I had men in my life. I still have men in my life. And so I, uh, I got that whole notion of when I went to a meeting, uh, the way they talked to me and stuff like that, I would I would get the distinct impression that they felt I was sleeping with the enemy. <clears throat> and somehow I just hadn't made the choice yet to be a lesbian and that that was something that all women should do, which is not a good notion to start with because individual freedom and choice is supposed to be what we're about in society, in an ideal society, in magic, in in a group, because mutual respect is rather important. Without mutual respect, you can't really work or do anything together. So we divided up um, the rituals. We would like take turns writing rituals and uh, for the seasons and so forth while we were you know together. And it was very interesting for me because every time I uh, planned a ritual, wrote it out performed it with other people. I would have a huge uh, split in the women. Some of them absolutely loved the rituals that I did, thought they were the most powerful, best things they'd ever had, or were just really happy with them. And then another group hated them like crazy, just absolutely despised my rituals. So it's very confusing for me because I couldn't figure out what kind of rituals I could do that would please everyone. Of course, the actual problem was we were not the right group of people to be together. And there was no way I could actually write a ritual that would please everyone because there was too much of a spectrum of uh, experience and beliefs amongst the women. Now, I have to say that um, I was insulted some often uh, by how I was treated in the group. I had a boyfriend at the time and uh, one of the group members, one of the women came to my house one day and we were outside and 
my boyfriend was standing right next to me. And I've never actually seen a person completely ignore the existence of another person in my life. It was very bizarre and I thought incredibly rude to deny the existence of the man who was standing next to me because she didn't like them and didn't want them around. Uh, other things that happened, abuse issues uh, that some of the women came with, and of course I have my own abuse issues so I understood that you know safety is uh, an issue. When we were doing rituals at my location, at my house, uh, I was in a large communal household and we had men and women living there. They were housemates. <clears throat> and I made sure, I thought, that we were safe. We were in a location where, you know, we weren't going to get interrupted. We were in the backyard and one of the women saw one of my housemates walk by a window. And he was a man and she completely freaked out. She lost her shit. She just went nuts and started crying and screaming that I had violated her and kept her unsafe, etc., etc., which was confusing for me because he was in the house behind glass and didn't approach us. He was just there. He just existed. There was no actual reason except in her mind that this created an unsafe environment. So I have that problem. And, uh, you know, at one point, uh, some of the, the women wanted to get into doing uh, what I considered negative magic, not something I wanted to participate in, punishing the men in their lives who had harmed them by imagining that they were destroying their genitalia, etc. And it just wasn't okay with me. And if you're going to do group magic, Everyone in the group needs to be comfortable with it. If you want to do that on your own, that's your business. But if you're going to do it in a group, everyone has to be on the same page when it comes to what is okay. So if you have an issue with that, you want to make sure that you're with a group of like-minded people to do that kind of magic together. And that you can trust your coven mates or your circle mates or whatever you want to call them. Because if they're willing to do that to someone else, they might be willing to do that to you if you piss them off. There's always that to consider. So, so we were definitely starting to have some issues, definitely not the right group of women to be together to do this kind of thing. And, uh, and this was, let's see, probably 80, 87 maybe, somewhere around there in Santa Cruz. And uh, one of the members of our group uh, was bisexual. She had been married to men and had children. She was currently female-oriented or woman. Anyway, she was with a woman <laughs> at the time. You know, so she was flexible, I guess. They have different terms for it nowadays, but I called it bisexual and, uh, you know, good with either sex, right? I'm sure there's lots of other more accurate terms nowadays because they're trying to define these things better. But anyway, she had met a lot of women who had been abused by other women uh, in lesbian relationships and wanted to bring to light the fact that the myth of women getting along with women and not having problems in their relationships as this idealized notion that we're better somehow was a lie. And the uh, local newspaper, can't think of the name of it right now, but uh, it's the alternative newspaper in Santa Cruz. She wanted to do a series of articles about that um, in the local newspaper. So they were reluctant to let her because the idea of breaking and bursting this bubble of women empowerment, et cetera, et cetera, seemed to be suicide for the newspaper. But they finally agreed to let her have an issue and then they did a disclaimer saying, we're not in charge of any of the content in this issue, this is all her. And so anything that's said in here, we have nothing to do with, so you can complain to her kind of thing. And it was a very powerful issue. I mean, they have exactly the same issues that any heterosexual couple might have, where they were, be you know, women were being beaten, they were being stalked, they were being uh, forced to do things they didn't want to do. They, you know, it, it, there's no difference really because it's a, it's a power thing. It's not about sexuality, it's not about male or female, it's about having power over another person 
and there are women who are like that and men who are like that. So it was a very um, intense thing for her to do, uh, important to her, she was really trying to help the community, and the meeting that week that the newspaper came out was at my house, or our communal house. So we were all sitting, uh, not the full coven, but you know there were like two of the women that were militant, uh, me, one of uh, my housemates who was in that group too, and and the woman, um, bisexual woman who was who did the newspapers. We'll call her Mary. That's not her name. <laughs> I'm trying to protect her identity just in case. So uh, Mary, let's say. She was extremely depressed. She was actually in tears. She was crying her heart out. Um, and she had been getting death threats from women in the community. People had been calling and yelling at her for daring to put this out there, which is always baffling to me because I think knowing the truth is better than not knowing the truth. You can't do anything about something if you don't know what's really going on. So if you continue to pretend that everything is working one way when it's actually working another, it's never going to work. So anyway, she was suicidal. It was very clear from how she spoke that she was feeling quite suicidal. And uh, the two women feminists who were sitting across from me just looked at her and said, well, you know, it's your bed. You made it. You lay in it. With no empathy, no compassion, um, no care for how she was reacting and how, how she was feeling about it. Of course, I'm an empath, and that doesn't work for me at all. And so I just immediately went over and put my arms around her, and I told the women that I was out of the group, she was out of the group, my friend in the house was out of the group, and they could leave my house, and I never wanted to see them again. We were done. This was crossing a line. There are certain kinds of lines for me that once a person has crossed them, there's no going back. It's just the way it is. I kicked him out of my house. And I feel still that that was the right thing to do. If you're going to be living a magical lifestyle, um, your, your personal ethics and how you act are your magic. If I had allowed that continu to continue and allowed those women to berate her and driven her potentially to suicide, I would be partially responsible for any results that would happen resulting from that. And, you know, it's like, this was a clear thing in my head at the time. This is wrong. I can't let this continue. I'm going to stop it. And so I did. So I got a call about, I'd say a week later, maybe, uh, from one of the women in the group. And she calls me up on the phone. She says, well, we, we, we honor your decision to leave the group, but we would really like to have some closure. So we would appreciate it if you would come to one last meeting so we can have a sense of closure. And I just about started laughing, and I thought, yeah, right, <laughs> your idea of closure, I know what that is. You want to have an opportunity to tell me how horrible I am, how much you don't like whatever I did, blah, 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 and dump on me. That seems pretty clear that that's about what's going to happen, considering their behavior before. So I sat and I thought about it for a while, and I thought, okay, I know what they want. Is there anything I can get out of this? Um, is there any reason for me to go? And I thought I was feeling pretty strong emotionally um, at the time, and I had gotten to know myself fairly well, so I knew what was and wasn't true. So I agreed to go. I thought this could be interesting to see what they have to say to me. So I went to the closure meeting, and sure enough, as I predicted, uh, each one of them got up and told me how I had disrespected them, or dishonored them, or violated them, or you know, a whole list litany of things that were basically all projections from them onto me, but not actually me which I knew, and I waited and listened to them all. And at the end, when they were done, I said, so now that you're finished telling me how you feel about me, then it's my turn to let you know how I feel about you. And they said yes. So I went through and I told each one of them what it was I admired the most about them. And I didn't lie about it. 
there were things about what they did I didn't appreciate and didn't like and would never participate in, but there were lots of things about them that I admired. And so I went through every single one of them and told them each what I admired the most, and then I got up and walked out. Don't know what happened after I left the room, doesn't matter. Might have been fascinating to be a fly on the wall to see how they took that. But that's the thing, is uh, when you're working with a group of people, you're working with a huge number of different personalities in different places, different levels of self-awareness and understanding, um, different reasons for being in it, and you never know for sure how it's going to end up. And especially since we began just as a random group of women thrown together for a, a class, it's not a good start. So if you're going to get together with people, I definitely recommend getting to know them a little bit first. It doesn't always solve that problem because there's still crazy people out there, but it gives you at least a leg up so you have some idea of what's going on. So that was that group. Now the, um, the group I was in with the mixed group of people, boundaries were a huge problem. Uh, and I didn't yet know how to have as good boundaries as I should, and I definitely didn't know how to stop other people from not having good boundaries. And in the end, although, you know, it seemed like I was trying to teach them what I knew, and it seemed that they knew what I was saying, and then I would say, okay, so now you do this, and they're like, what? Do what? I'm like, you know, cast a circle, call in the directions. I don't know how to do that. And I'm like, what? So I always was doing the everything, which was frustrating. And then there was some sexual tension that developed between uh, one couple and another man. And then the woman from the couple and the single man got together and then the whole thing just sort of exploded and fell apart and went in who knows how many different directions and before I knew it, it was over. So that was that experience. We've had groups since then, and um, so far, they come and they go. People come and they go. They have different reasons for wanting to be in a group. And if you're a person who has a fair amount of experience, and you're working with people who don't, and haven't gone through their um, personal processes uh, of looking within themselves and figuring out where they are at, and you know what their issues are and work through their issues or aren't willing to do that with the group then it doesn't work for long it can work for a while but it doesn't work for long and uh, you know we had one woman who completely freaked out when she heard that we used robes everything else was fine but robes freaked her out instead of looking at why robes freaked her out and that robes are just a you know <laughs> A piece of clothing, <laughs> ritual clothing that you can use for special occasions to say, hey, this is something special. I'm going to put this special outfit on and I'm going to do some special stuff. Um, that was it for her. We had another woman who freaked out when we used black candles. Everything else was fine. Black candles, bad. It's like, it's just a color. And, and that's the thing. It's like, you have stuff you have to work through on your own anyway. <laughs> what the heck was that? Something decided to make a point. It folded down. Yeah. So anyway, there's there's always that kind of stuff. And ideally, okay, even in a group. So you have a group. Let's say you actually decided, you found the people you think that are good to work together. You have enough in common that you want to do some work together. You still need to do your own work. That's the other thing. It's like you always have a personal path, regardless of the, of the group that you're in. You have to have a personal path. If you don't continue to develop your personal relationship with the universe, then things will just come along and sort of, whew, sort of throw you to the wind and you won't know what's going on. So even if you do decide that a group is the thing that you want, and there are definitely benefits for group energy, I love group work. <laughs> if it wasn't for the people that were in it, that would be fantastic. But if you have a common goal, I mean, if you're going to do group energy, group work, you got to have a common vision. That's important. 
without a common vision, you won't ever get anything done. And, you know, it's okay to have different viewpoints to the common vision, but everyone, when they come together in the circle to do the magic, has to set aside all that stuff, leave it at the door, and come in and just work the magic. And then later they can, you know, you can talk about what worked, what didn't work, what you liked, what you didn't like, um, how you might want to change it to make it better. If you think it's the best thing that's ever happened, that's okay too. You know, you don't have to pick anything apart if you like what's happening. But that's how group work, good group work works. So it, it helps to have a goal if you're going to work together as a group, whether it's self-development, um, healing work, uh, putting out fires in Australia, whatever it happens to be. Uh, you have a common purpose for getting together and you all have an agreement that this is your common purpose and this is what you're going to do. It can be just celebrating the holidays. It can be just making moon water or going out during the full moon or working with the dark moon or, you know, it, the, the, it's, the thing itself isn't the important part. It's the fact that everyone wants to do that thing together. Like, like this is something we can agree on. And to realize that there are going to be issues that come up in a group. And if people aren't doing their own work, it's going to really snowball. Then if you're unlucky and you end up with a sociopath joining your group, <laughs> all bets are off. Because sociopaths are a special breed, and they're really good at coming into a group and completely dividing everybody that's in there and destroying it from the inside. And that's what happened to us. That's one of the things that happened to us. The other thing is we were actually starting to get somewhere, and, and I don't know how to explain this. Um, we were doing drawing down the moon rituals, and they were becoming more and more powerful with the group. And at one point, the last one that we did, the goddess came through and she said, you've been noticed. And then I knew we would be tested. And when we were done testing, nobody was left except my husband and I and one other person. Everyone else is gone. And it's not like, I mean, there's a reason for it because if you're gonna get into the more potent and intense magic, you need to be ready for it, and if you're not ready for it, you can't pass whatever that test is that she gave us, <laughs> which was like, you know, a um, test of commitment, a test of will, I don't know. Everyone had a different one, I'm, I'm assuming. Um, but anyway, that's what happened. So no matter how much I love group work, right now I'm a, we're still, we're doing still some group work. I mean, my husband, myself, and our one member, when we can get together, we do some group work. But we're also doing our own individual thing and, and doing, it, it doesn't stop you from working. So those are some of the pitfalls of group. And you wanna be careful too if you end up in, uh, we are having more and more pagan cults pop up um, around the country. Uh, because of the opportunity to be in charge and tell people what they have to do in order to get where they want to go. Uh, so if you aren't willing to do something, don't do it. I don't care who tells you you need to do it, whatever it might be. And the, the sexual misconduct that's happened in some groups by both women and men has been disheartening to see that that's happening in our community, but we are a community made up of people and that's what we're dealing with, people. There are people out there in all religions and all spiritual paths that will abuse the privilege of their position of authority and use it to try and pump up their own ego or control other people or whatever. So it's up to you as the individual to be aware of that. And if someone says, if you don't do this, you can't join the group. If you don't have sex with me, the goddess can't come into you. I'm the only one who can give you the goddess. Run. <laughs> Just turn around and run as fast as you can because that isn't true. That doesn't have to happen. I don't care how it may have happened in the ancient past or any other. 
justification that may come up if someone tells you that it's a lie it's not true and if you're not comfortable with it don't do it you don't need to give up your power in order to be in a group in order to get the power that's not how it works the whole point is to get your personal power that's what you want no one else can give it to you you can only take it for yourself so solitary work you don't have to worry about any of that stuff when you're doing stuff on your own. It's just you and the gods or you and the energies or you and nature or you and the universe or whatever your concept of this might be. And the only thing you have to worry about, worry about at that point is your own brain. <laughs> so your own brain can trick you, make you think things are happening when they're not. You have to learn how to ground and how to clear and how to be discerning about what's going on. The problem with that can happen for solitaries is they can get so far into their own their own story and their own path that they're creating for themselves and there's no one around to see that you know you started off about here but now you're like way the hell over here we don't know how you got there and you don't know what you're doing and you're now wandering down the middle of the street with no clothes on in traffic thinking that this is what you're supposed to be up to so a, a group can help uh, pull people back it can be annoying if you really think you're on to something and someone says wait a minute <laughs> you need to think about this but at least you have that possibility you have other perspectives of what's going on and it's uh, harder to get trapped in your own narrative when you're a solitary your own narrative can become everything so then it's up to you to sort of self um, look at your own storyline your own narrative and see what it's composed of is this because I want to be seen by myself as an all-powerful being of infinite ability. I mean, we met a guy who came into our house who thought that him, me, and my husband were going to be the three angels that were left after everyone else was dead and we were going to reshape the world. And I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> I'm like, no, I don't think so. But I listen because that's what I do. As an empath, I hear people's stories. I don't, like, contradict them. Unless, of course, they're trying to get me to do it with them, at which point I'm like, I'm sorry, this isn't going to work for me. Um, no one can convince me to do something I don't want to do, which is a good thing. You don't want to be convinced to do something you don't want to do. So, you know, you, you can meet people like that, and you can sort of watch them, but you don't have to participate in their form of delusion. And just because all things might be possible doesn't mean that most things are likely. So, you know, kind of get a little bit of grounding in there and figure out what's what. But, like I said, with the solitary stuff, you don't have to answer to anybody except for you and your personal deity or the nature or the tree or whatever it is that you're doing it can be harder to make progress because you can get distracted by having to go to the grocery store having to cook a meal having to raise a, a, a child i mean there's a lot of things that happen in life that can pull us away from doing just the magical you know the, the magic itself and that's normal because the tides come in the tides go out ebb and flow is natural so don't beat yourself up if you go even a couple of weeks or something without doing something it doesn't have to be something every day it should be an inner feeling that you carry with you wherever you go no matter what you're doing so when you're going to the grocery store you're paying attention to the people that are in the store or what's happening in the store or what's going on around you um, if suddenly a bird lands on your cart while you're leaving the parking lot, you know, going to your car, you might want to pause and think, okay, why is this bird on my cart? Is this something meaningful? It doesn't have to be, but it could be. So you have to just sort of stay alert and stay aware. But anyway, it's life. It's an experience. There's all this stuff that's going on, and there's no one right way to do it. There's just a lot of different ways, and some ways work for you and some don't. So, good luck finding a group, and hopefully some of what I've, if you want a group, and hopefully something, some of what I've said will help you to 
determine what a good group might be and or um, figure out ways to motivate yourself when you're doing stuff on your own. Have a daily routine or a weekly routine. One of the things that I do is every time I take a bath, it's a ritual. I have a piece of aquamarine um, uh, on the bathtub. And so every bath I take, I cast the water element into the bath and I put the aquamarine in there to do a cleansing of my emotions as well as my physical body. And every time I pull the plug, after I release the water element, I pull the plug and anything that's in the water, my emotions, my feelings, and my soil, <laughs> dirt stuff, all go down the drain and leave me. So you can do stuff like that. It doesn't have to be elaborate. It doesn't have to be a giant ritual. It doesn't have to be a spell. It's not like you're a bad witch if you don't do a spell all the time or do something magical every single minute of every single day. So hopefully this has been helpful. If you have any questions, please let me know. And this is Shefer's Magic Alcove, and I am Shefer Bradigan. Blessed be.